Paul McGuire, and you are now listening to the Paul McGuire Report. Uh, a number of years ago, it must have been quite a while ago, actually, I was sitting on a plane uh, heading towards a conference. I forgot where I was speaking. It, it, I was either flying to a conference or flying on my way back. So in any case, uh, on this particular flight, they had the uh, television screen, the flat television screen, <clears throat> embedded into the seat right in front of me where I was sitting. So, like, you know, if I wanted to, you, know, you can watch television. <clears throat> you can look at a map of where the plane is flying, how fast it's flying, the altitude. You can look at, like, a uh, satellite recreation image of that, and you can. You can do all kinds of like entertainment things, okay? So I don't really get involved in, in much of that because most of the time when I'm uh, speaking at conferences and stuff, I have a very, very heavy schedule uh, because I got a lot of things to do. So that means, uh, you know, I don't sit around luxuriously waiting for my flight. <clears throat> What it usually means, because uh, I live in uh, northern Los Angeles County, the only way, and I've tried it logistically every way you possibly can imagine, the only way you can beat the traffic and get to your destination, let's just say, let's say it's uh, in, in the USA, the only way you can do that is you have to wake up at about 2 a.m., or 1.30 a.m. in the morning, which is ridiculous, which means you get no sleep, all right? And the reason you have to do that is because if you just got up early to fly to your destination, that, that wouldn't work because um, you would run smack dab into the middle of what we call the biggest parking lot in the world, which is the 405 freeway. And it's the 405 freeway that I have to take all the way from where I live, um, past Century City and other things. And finally, you will arrive at LAX, okay, Los Angeles International Airport. But the point is, it's not good enough just to get up a couple of hours early because all that will do is force you to collide in a gigantic traffic jam of compu uh, com uh, commuters. So the only way to beat it is is to go through the agony of, get, of, of being in your car and hitting the road at like no more than 2 a.m. or 1.30 a.m. Okay, so I'm in the plane, you know, you get, you get molested practically when you get searched, uh, and I'm being uh, somewhat satirical, but not totally. So, you know, I was playing with the map, uh, the electronic map, and the flat screen in front of me. And, you know, I was tired, so, like, I was only intending to do this for a couple of minutes, and then, you know, I was going to, like, fall asleep. So, um, I was playing with different geographic Territory. So the first thing I did was look at a map of the world, and then I saw, you know, uh, 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 flight routes for this particular airline. And just for kicks, I had never done this before, I don't know why I did it, I decided to go north on the map to, um, um, well, I decided to visit um, the Arctic and Antarctica and then play around in those areas. I was specifically interested in Antarctica because of all the legendary myths and stuff and, and all the research I've done. You know, there's a, there's a gold mine of information of, about the, the speculation of, of a uh, super race from the stars that went under the ice and uh, built themselves a super civilization to survive 
and to escape uh, a great flood uh, coming on planet Earth. You know, it's interesting, all these, this is a Nordic myth, but all these mythologies, they have uh, similar themes, like a theme of a great flood, and that comes right out of the book of Noah and the flood judgment. So in any case, what I noticed playing around with the satellite is that unlike every other place on planet Earth, I could go to a location, I could zoom in, and I could get in close enough to see, uh, you know, cars, buildings, houses, stuff like that. And it would be interesting to look at because it would be in focus and it would be close enough. All right. It's kind of like when you have GPS. Uh, You've probably noticed this by now, but um, you you play around with GPS and you can zoom in neighborhoods and houses and where people live and where buildings are and all kinds of stuff. But You've probably noticed by now that most of the time, if you're using your GPS and you're uh, flying over a a, uh, zip code that is affluent or a neighborhood, houses and a community that would be considered affluent where the people have money and power and lawyers, what happens is that all of a sudden your GPS is like blocked. The satellite image will only allow you to go so close. So if you're looking down uh, from outer space via satellite and you're looking at the top of somebody's house or whatever, or if you're looking at their car in the garage or whatever, Depending upon what neighborhood you're in, you can see up close very, very clearly, which means you can do things like read uh, the license number on the car license and other really close up things. But when you get into the neighborhoods where people have lawyers and people have a higher income, then you, you really can't zoom in all that close on the neighborhoods, the houses, the properties, et cetera, et cetera. There's like an invisible electronic wall, and you can only get so close, and then obviously some kind of computer is programmed to block you out from really seeing up close. So what is that all about? Well, it's it's about, once again, an exposure of the truth over mythology. The truth of the matter is, if you have bucks, if you have money, if you have power, and you have position, then you have uh, an unusual amount of electronic privacy. The big tech companies and, uh, and satellites and stuff like that and GPS, they will not, they'll block you. Not like you're doing anything wrong. Let's say you just want to see, is there a road between two properties? Well, you can't see that because if it's an affluent neighborhood, it it all becomes fuzzy. And what it is, it's an extra, no-charge privilege of having money that that the, the GPS won't get close up on your property if you're in an affluent neighborhood. Now, it doesn't follow a total rule because there. I've looked at some affluent neighborhoods and they look you can get really close, and I've looked at just middle class and working class neighborhoods, and and you're blocked. But for the most part, it does work. Now, why am I saying this? Okay, so I'm checking out Antarctica because hey, what the heck? It's it's uh, it's a uh, audio visual recreation, lifelike computer model of Antarctica. So I I'm, I'm really having a lot of fun because this is a lot better than using a map or even a home computer. And what I noticed was with Antarctica is that you were fully allowed to see from a satellite point of view all the stuff that is superficial. You're allowed to see the stuff that is not really all that important. And you are electronically blocked 
from seeing anything that would ask really important questions. Like, for example, I wanted to get close up and see if there were any cave-like entranceway structures. Because, you know, you've heard, I've heard, you've heard so many rumors and speculations about some underground city or whatever uh, that supposedly uh, in the caves under uh, the frozen ice of Atlantis. And uh, supposedly there's warm water and trees and, and flowers and fruit growing. You know, that could be a total, uh, a complete fantasy. But it also could potentially, potentially have some truth in it. So I was trying to check it out for myself. But I was being blocked electronically. And that didn't do me a whole lot of good. Because you see, the biggest mythology that, that, that surrounds Antarctica is that uh, Antarctica, a super civilization that came from the stars, descendants of the Vikings, uh, the Vikings were their descendants, etc. And when the great flood came on planet Earth, this super civilization of blonde haired, blue, blue eyed, red haired, light skinned, uh, I guess they were Nephilim hybrids, they, they escaped Europe as it started to flood, so the historical legend goes. And then they uh, established their own world to live in, where their spaceship was originally, which is under Antarctica. Now, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying that's what the, the legends say. So the other part of the legend is, is that there's an underground sun called Vril, V-R-I-L. And the Vril force, which emanates from this underground sun, is supposedly somehow tied in to the molten lava and boiling metals, etc., at the center of the Earth's core. Um, you know, it's supposed to be like liquid, heated metal. And somehow this ties in to Vril, and, and su- supposedly, uh, according to the ancient legends, when you see this Vril force, it, it looks like a midnight sun. You know, it's this round thing embedded in the Earth and it's throwing off as much light as the sun. It's warming the air. But according to the legends, the Vril force emanates a a force that is a force of EMF, electromagnetic frequency power. It's a force of healing. It's a force of higher consciousness because When a human being comes in proximity to the Vril force, the specific electromagnetic frequencies that the Vril force are operating on entrains the human brain and alters and modifies and supposedly raises the consciousness level of human beings. And so the Vril force is supposed to be useful in the transmission of energy for weapons, healing energy, uh, some of the Nikola Tesla stuff, um, and a a whole spectrum uh, of things. So on the basis of that, you had numerous secret cult, secret societies in Germany, in Europe, in the Nordic nations you know, for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. And many of them were based on this legendary drill force. And so um, this is the reason, by the way, that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis and the Nazi scientists and the big Nazi generals and propaganda experts like Werner von Braun, the rocket scientists, and uh, uh, Himmler, a uh, very evil Nazi 
and Goebbels, uh, evil Nazi, and, and father of Nazi propaganda, and Hitler. They were all obsessed with these occult powers and forces, like the Vril Force. So you had the Vril Society, then you had what was called the Thule Society, T-H-U-L-E, and then you had um, um, a number of other secret societies uh, based on a German cultism, uh, the, the occultism of ancient Tibet, the, the legendary Nordic legends. Oh, and added to that list of occult secret societies would have been skull and bones. And I was watching, uh, I was looking at a picture on the internet, and it, it was it, the it was a liberal publication, but they were mocking Kerry because they were pro-environmental. And Kerry was sitting on a commuter flight on the East Coast, but he didn't wear his mask at all. He had his mask sitting in the other seat, and he had this totally indifferent look on his face, like he was saying, these rules don't apply to me. The mask rules don't apply to me. So for all his blah, 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 blah about, you know, being concerned about the spread of the virus, like so many of these politicians on the left and right, <clears throat> in their private palatial world, they don't wear um, masks and stuff like that. So he wasn't wearing a mask. And it doesn't surprise me because people like him and people like George Bush Jr., so one's a Democrat, one's a Republican, doesn't really matter that one's a Democrat or one's a Republican, because in the real world, not the matrix world of illusion, they're both, both Kerry and Bush Jr. are both members of the same occultic secret society, Skull and Bones. They're wor both working for the same globalist satanic masters. And so, and so, you know, the superficial differences don't mean anything. Now, why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this to, to share with you my disappointment that I, I, I couldn't get any real stuff on Antarctica. I was speaking at a conference in uh, Colorado a couple of years ago, and a lady came up to me, and I'm going to disguise the discussion so you, you will not know who I'm talking about. And this lady flew into the conference from New York City, and we began talking. And she told me that uh, she had befriended or become acquaintances with uh, uh, the head of the United Nations wife and the head of the United Nations, which at that time, uh, the head of the United Nations was Maurice Strong. And so she befriended Maurice Strong and uh, his wife. Now, this is a completely God thing, because there's no human way that the door should have been open for her to mix with these people. They're in the stratosphere in terms of, you know, the pecking order of mankind. But God gave her favor. And so she told me that... Uh, due to the prodding of Maurice Strong's wife. And, and let me just tell you something about Maurice Strong. Maurice Strong is a super, 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 super billionaire. I've been writing about him for years in my books. In fact, I write uh, a great deal about him, who he really is, in my book, A Prophecy of the Future of, of America, Volume 1, and A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2, and Mass Awakening and Conquering the Matrix and the Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, which I've discounted uh, significantly for you if you get you purchase them in book bundles. And so I often, I've been talking about uh, this guy who heads up the United Nations uh, for years and years and years, because first of all, he's a super billionaire. Second of all, and I go into great detail about this in my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, Maurice Strong, uh, 
I don't know if he's still alive, but he um, had a palatial, and I say palatial, magnify that by a million times, a palatial, heavily guarded uh, condo apartment where he probably owned two or three floors in one of China's most, communist China's most elegant, sophisticated cities where he lived like a god king. And uh, it's interesting how these billionaires like to uh, hang out <clears throat> in, in quasi-dictatorships like communist China. I don't, I don't know if you would call Dubai a communist dictatorship, but Dubai is definitely run by an authoritarian regime. And if you look at the pictures <clears throat> by doing some kind of internet search, if you look at the pictures of the hotels and things like that in Dubai and communist China, it looks like something out of a Tom Cruise movie, Mission Impossible. In fact, I think he, he shot a bunch of Mission Impossible movies in these locations because they're so elegant and futuristic at the same time. So Maurice Strong is a heavy New Age occultist, okay? Plus, he's one of the richest men in the world. Plus, he is been the head of the United Nations, and he has headed up numerous United Nations task forces where the goal is to bring about a one-world religion and a one-world economic system. But his, his focus is the one-world religion. And he has bought thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of pristine land in the state of Colorado. He's bought up some significant percentage of the entire state of Colorado. And he, he, he's purchased it to make it like a civilization within a civilization. So to make it like a new age civilization. So there's actual Indian, this is like endless acres. There's like Indian reservations. There's New Age retreat centers with gurus. There's all kinds of occult centers and headquarters. And it's kind of like it's kind of like this futuristic, occultic, but but very, very beautiful mountainous. And it's a massive percentage of the state of Colorado. But he's rich enough to buy the whole thing. And he's using it to promote New Age spirituality, and one world religion. So this lady I was talking to was a reader of my books, a follower of my ministry, and she had heard me speak at a bunch of conferences, so she walked over to me, introduced herself, and told me that she was going to be sailing out on a cruise ship like in the next month. Somehow, she got private exclusive tickets to sail out on a cruise ship where the, uh, the cruise ship was one of the most elegant in the world, and it was packed with dignitaries and billionaires and people like Al Gore and John Kerry and Gates and people like that, okay? And, and what she wanted to do is asked me for one of my books, and uh, because she wanted, there, there's a small church uh, on the ice when you land in uh, Antarctica, and the church has been there for like ever. It's, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of years old. But in this small church, they have a library for Christian books and Bibles, and she thought it would be a good thing to do from a spiritual perspective uh, and kind of like spiritually laying claim to territory. So she wanted to know if I would give her one of my books, which I gladly did. I gave her a copy, I believe, of The, of, uh, the Day the Dollar Died, which is, by the way, an entire critique and analysis of people like Maurice Strong, all these billionaires, and their covert plans for a one-world economic system and a one-world religion. So she was going to put my book 
right there in the middle of all these New Age books as kind of a symbolic testimony. So, uh, and then she told me that the Carries were going to be on the boat, Al Gore were going to be on the boat, and a lot of really, really, you know, the top of the pyramid people, like, I, I can't remember for sure everybody's name, but all of the people, with the exception of her, who were on this incredible cruise ship, visiting kind of like secret places uh, in Antarctica, were people at the level of John Kerry, Al Gore, Bill Gates, uh, and people of that level. And they were all gathered together for some reason that she was trying to, to, to play detective and figure out what it was. There was something going on. There was some discovery or something that was going on, and that was the reason all these global elite uh, were swooping down on Antarctica to check it out. So I thought you might think that that's interesting, because it's not just, you know, people like me, people like you, who, who have an interest in these bigger and deeper topics like what happened with Antarctica. There's a reason why a giant computer corporation would use its airline GPS systems and deliberately uh, program those satellite images not to, not to be able to do a close-up of Antarctica, to censor what's really happening in Antarctica from the people because something is going on there, and they're hiding it. And the question is, why are they hiding it? And I don't want to get into that now, but it, it has a lot to do with, with the, the, the bigger topic we're talking about, and it has a lot to do with the New World Order, the One World Government, the One World Religion, and the One World Economic System. Because none of that stuff, the, the only people who think those categories of research are like a conspiracy theory. The only people who think that those categories of research are a conspiracy theory, those are the same people whose minds and consciousness exist in a realm of, and I'm not trying to be mean, but their consciousness exists in a realm of being dumbed down, in a realm of stupidity, and a, uh, a realm of uh, Perception that you can that you can perceive with your eyes and your ears, etc., but you don't have the cognitive abilities to process what you've perceived. Because anybody who's intelligent, anybody who's well read, anybody who's done their homework knows that there's an enormous amount of serious questions revolving around the Arctic, Antarctica. The Americas, uh, the Egyptian pyramids, um, the Nazi rocket scientists, the Nazi mind control scientists, et cetera, et cetera. But once again, the globalist elite, they want to one, one size shoe fits all. They want to cram everybody's kids and all the adults, they want to cram you into what I call. Uh, the mind control factories and program your mind. See, what people don't understand is the primary way they brainwash you and and uh, utilize scientific mind control on you and put you in a hypnotic state, the primary way they dumb you down, et cetera, et cetera, it's not so much just the specific censoring of specific uh, areas of knowledge or specific categories of knowledge or specific facts or specific historical facts or scientific facts or technological facts. If they were just censoring that, that would be massively detrimental. And the end result would be is that you would be programming millions of people to be scientifically dumbed down via 
not an educational process, an indoctrinational process, because the Huxley brothers, uh, Sir Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, and uh, <clears throat> Julian Huxley, who became the head of the United Nations UNESCO Department, which is the United Nations Educational and Global Science Department. So they standardize education globally. And so they dumb everybody down globally in a similar manner, teaching them a common curriculum or a common core. And it's important for you to understand that common core is not some savior that was invented or discovered by educators in the last five years. Far from it. Common Core is a deliberate, strategic methodology of not education, but indoctrination, and it is designed to take students and make them dumb them down, make them dumber, uh, um, uh, throw the monkey wrench in the gears of their cognitive abilities. That's the real purpose for Common Core, because Common Core is built on like a cybernetic engineering me mechanism. I'm not trying to be pretentiously using fancy words, but cybernetics is like comes from the ancient Greek word of steering, like a vessel, etc. And then cybernetics was adopted by computer programmers, computer scientists, computer technology, and cybernetics was then blended with the programming of the human mind because uh, the programmers of, uh, of uh, computers began to realize there's a, that there's a big similarity between how a computer is programmed and how a human mind is programmed. And one of the processes is called cybernetics. And it goes back to the 1920s where they were developing cybernetic theory. And so what they did is they learned that they could program young kids, they could program young adults, they could program adults through various inputs that stimulate the brain, or at least act as if they stimulate the brain. So the inputs would be television, internet, um, social media, radio movies, music, and all this other stuff function as stimuli. And that means they actually, um, they contain information, either true or false. And, and the sum total of that information, either true or false, generates a specific numerical electromagnetic frequency wave, all right? Everything in the world generates a specific electromagnetic frequency wave, including every human being, including curriculum, study, et cetera, et cetera. So the name of the game is, if you want to dominate planet Earth, if you want to control planet Earth, which we know the, global, the globalist elite that, that's their number one goal. They want to, who will rule the world? They want to rule the world. I'm, I'm writing a new book on that subject right now. It's going to blow your mind. In fact, I think I'm going to make it available for pre-order. And it's the sequel to a book I wrote called Who Will Rule the Future, which I wrote in I think, 1991. And what I said was going to happen in 1991, in my book, Who Will Rule the Future, essentially, it all happened. Okay? Which means the research, the study, the praying, the analysis that I did, which is another word for hard work, enabled me to accurately project, depict, and analyze what was going to happen in the future. And the reason I'm saying that is because we have all these Christians who are looking for shortcuts 
to, to be blunt, they're lazy. Lazy people don't like to work hard. But the problem is when you're lazy in, in, in any endeavor that God has given you to do, such as a vocation or anything that God has called you to do, if you're lazy as you go about it, whether you're a cabinet maker, an auto mechanic, salesman, a financial advisor, a minister, it doesn't really matter. The, the spectrum of, of occupational uh, pursuits is, is endless. But let's not forget that God has embedded his word, the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation. God has embedded his word with what I call kingdom principles, or principles of the kingdom of God. And these transcend mere humanistic, man-made principles. What they do is they incorporate or they link a biblical worldview and the truths of God's word based on a biblical worldview. They link that to um, human knowledge, human philosophy, human wisdom, and a human worldview. Now. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, no pun intended, to figure out that when we operate our lives, when we operate our nation, our culture, our communities, our families, our churches, our world, our relationships, our economics, our jobs, when we operate all of those things, and I just gave you a sprinkler, when we operate those things, according to God's wisdom and a biblical worldview. And by a biblical worldview, I mean God's knowledge and wisdom from Genesis to Revelation. And God's biblical worldview is not a tiny compartmentalized worldview. A truly biblical worldview applies and integrates the knowledge of God's Word in its entirety. And it connects the truth of God's Word in its entirety do things like psychology, psychiatry, neurological sciences, biomedicine, biology, genetics, mathematics, economics, military, warfare, um, and on and on and on and on. All kinds of creativity, government, medicine, law, uh, the way you structure a society or plan lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you're basing all of your decisions on a rock-solid foundation known as a biblical worldview, your st statistical percentage of success, your statistical percentage of getting things right, your statistical percentage of excellence and uh, hitting the target, it just skyrockets. On a percentage basis, you're, you're hitting the bullseye just over and over again. Why? Because you're basing the sum total of the wisdom of your life and the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of your, for your family and, and all kinds of things. You're basing it on the wisdom, the eternal wisdom of God's Word. And there is no more powerful no more omniscient, no more staggering body of information than the eternal wisdom of Almighty God. Let's, let's do a little flashback here. Who is God? God, it says in Genesis, is the supreme being. God is the Creator, capital C. So, God is the Creator, capital C. He created everything, including us. And we are His creation, lowercase c. He's the Creator, capital C. So, when we uh, incorporate or utilize or operate our lives, our society, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on knowledge that springs from a biblical worldview, we have catapulted 
ourselves into a very uh, high-level niche of understanding and strategy and success ratio. And, and Christians not only should know this, but true Bible-believing evangelical Christians should not only know this, but they should be riding the surf wave of this momentum. They should be uh, uh, be the beneficiaries of this download of God's knowledge and his wisdom. Because in the, the book of Proverbs, we read over and over again about how important it is to, to get God's wisdom, to get God's guidance, to get God's knowledge, etc., etc. Knowledge is power. Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So, this is a critical, critical area. Now, at this area, and we're just going to pause for a nanosecond, but at this area, and remember, it's perhaps one of the most critical areas of getting knowledge and wisdom that's available to us as human beings. So it warrants that we pause a little bit and contemplate the enormity of what this means. It means that you and I have direct access to the wisdom and the biblical worldview of God Almighty. We have direct access to the intelligence and the knowledge and the guidance of God. This is critical. This is, this is, a, this is a game changer. And here's where it becomes most important. As I said with the title of my book, we are in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. That battle is raging now inside the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere. It essentially means that inside the hearts and minds of men and women everywhere, there's a raging war between ideas where, that are based on lies, satanic deception, um, uh, non-scientific science, um, all kinds of error, all kinds of failures, and the, the sum total of being dumbed down made stupid by not an educational process, but made stupid by an uh, indoctrination process. So, how do we revisit this parameter so that we, we, so that we benefit from it and we're not cursed by it? In other words, if we perceive the reality of God having a biblical worldview that we can tap into when we're diligent to read and study the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, when we're willing to obey God in that area, we, we now have the awesome privilege by faith to tap in to the infinite resources of God Almighty. And we now build our lives on that solid rock foundation, Jesus Christ. And you see, when we're operating our lives, our relationship, our money, our health, and everything else, when we are operating all of that based on a solid rock intellectual, historical knowledge, scientific knowledge foundation of um, a biblical worldview, once we choose to operate from that POV, that point of view, once we choose to operate from that context, once we choose to operate from the parameters of a biblical worldview, the next inevitable result is we automatically become people of power, people of intellectual power, knowledge power, historical power, scientific power, gifting power, knowledge power, as I said. We're now operating 
from a place of power, and we're now operating from a place where there exists a seat of authority, a seat of governance or rulership or authority. Now, this is critical that we have a revelation of what this really means by the Holy Spirit. It's not satisfactory before God to, like, just glide through this and not really have an in-depth revelation as to what this means. Because that's not going to yield the harvest that we're looking for. What we want to do is revisit uh, all of these factors and from the foundation of a biblical worldview. We, it's from that foundation, based on our personal faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, based on our personal faith that Jesus Christ cleansed us of all of our sins, based on our personal faith, faith that Jesus Christ um, died so that we could be born again, based on our personal faith that um, Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we must have a tangible and legal revelation of who Christ is and exactly who we are in Jesus Christ. So who are we in Jesus Christ? Well, we are more than conquerors. In Christ Jesus. We are joint heirs with Jesus. This simply means that standing in the courtroom of God, standing before the throne room of God, believing and receiving the law of God by faith, we receive the blessing, we receive in the courts of heaven legally the full inheritance as people that are now joint heirs with Jesus and and uh, uh, overcomers of Jesus. As joint heirs with Jesus, that means we jointly and legally inherit all things, all blessings, all resources that are guaranteed to be dispensed to us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So we are guaranteed by faith to be joint heirs with Jesus. That means that we receive things like the legal authority to rule and reign with Christ, the legal authority to sit on a throne as a joint heir with Jesus, and then as a joint heir with Jesus, we jointly, with Jesus Christ, King of King and Lord of Lords, we jointly inherit with him the vast resources of God. All the blessings, all the inheritances of God, which are infinite, we are the legally bound recipients of, of all this inheritance. And so we inherit title, privilege, power, Authority, rulership, wealth, favor, dominion, we inherit all of that. See, the devil has tried to blind Bible-believing Christians from who they really are for thousands of years. The devil lied to Eve, and um, he played mind games with her. And so she ate from the tree in the middle of the garden, and she got Eve to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. At that moment, they activated the law of sin and death. They fell, and the death force entered the human race. And so they lost their power, their blessing, their authority, their dominion, their favor, their wealth, and countless other things that were contained in their inheritance in Christ Jesus. This is really powerful. So you and I live in a world right now where there's 
X amount of years for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in this world, we legally are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, originally, God gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, paradise, he gave them not only the authority to rule and reign as the king and queen of planet Earth, but he gave Adam and Eve the rulership, the authority, and the dominion to function as kings and queens over planet Earth to rule and reign over planet Earth. This is critical that we have a revelation of this, not not a puny intellectual understanding, but we have a certifiable revelation of what this means. Because what it means is, if, if we were to receive the burst of eternal life, that flash of eternal life that goes off, when we have a revelation of of God's Word, we would understand, we would understand in all its fullness that God wasn't joking. God wasn't making small talk. As I was reading you scriptures the other day, and God says in Genesis that he has given mankind dominion or rulership or the authority to rule and reign over their lives and planet Earth. These are critical things, because this this has to do with the core, the truth of your identity. Again, at this juncture, the only way that you're going to understand this on the multidimensional level that God wants you to understand it on is You have to have a revelation from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. You have to have a revelation from the Holy Spirit of the full meaning of what God has promised his people in Adam and Eve as joint heirs with Jesus. Nothing else will do but having a full revelation. So, what this means is this. We can know this abstractly. We can know it from a distance. We can know it religiously. None of that is sufficient. The only way we're going to knock the ball out of the uh, baseball field with the bases loaded is, is, is to have trained and to be able to use that bat and smack that bat at the right place of the of the hard ball and knock that ball out of the, the ball field with the bases loaded. That's what that's where God is bringing you right now. So that's where God, that's where your encounter with God is right now. And so what this means is that you have to have a revolution in your inner man, your emotions, your intellect, your cognitive abilities your perception, your intelligence, your logic, and your reason, and your understanding of a biblical worldview. And so this is how it plays out. Because God's people made the choice, Adam and Eve made the choice to disobey God and reject the Word of God, which means they ate from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. When they did that, when they disobeyed God, They activated the law of sin and death. That means they instantaneously received the death force in them. They began to die. They lost their immortality, their supernatural power, their supernatural intelligence. They became ashamed, naked, and afraid for the first time in their lives. And now, for the first time in their lives, they were under a curse and not a blessing. And and to finish the whole thing off, Satan now becomes the temporary God of this world, which simply means Satan, because Adam and Eve have disobeyed God, Satan is now the temporary ruler and reigner, that English, but you get it, of planet Earth. 
Okay, so for a temporary basis, that means until Christ returns to rule and reign planet Earth from Jerusalem. So on a temporary basis, God is, I mean, not God, Satan has the temporal authority to rule and reign planet Earth through people that have sold their soul to him, through uh, the usage of fallen angels and demons, and through his supernatural power. So, where does this bring us? It brings us to the pivotal moment. It brings us to the ultimate choice that we all need to make as believers in Jesus Christ. And that means we need to look in the mirror and truthfully ask ourselves honest questions and listen to the voice of the Lord, listen to our consciences as they convict us, as they speak to us. And then we need to be prepared to repent of our sins, our disobedience regarding his word. We have to repent because we can't change direction until we repent. So the question that has to be asked is very simple, but very powerful. If Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that means he's King of kings and Lord of lords. He died for your sins and my sins on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sins. If we invite Christ into our life, we're born again. We're guaranteed eternal life in heaven. If all of that is true, and it is true if we put our faith in God's word, then we are now factually more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And so, it is obvious to us, if we have any rational ability left in us, as we look at our world, look at the educational systems, look at government, look at science, look at medicine, look at the chaos America's in right now. We're in economic chaos, and it's on its way to getting worse. Why? Because we have people running our entire system who don't know the first thing about economic growth and so on and so forth. And so our nation, our once free nation, is being ruled by, uh, you know, trying to avoid saying fools, but that's essentially what's happening. We're being ruled by fools and opportunists and thieves and charlatans. So the question we have to ask is, I read on the top of the Drudge Report yesterday that for the first time since the history of America, since America was founded, for the first time in America's history, church attendance across the board is going down. And it has been going down like every five or ten years by a significant percentage. So the reality is that that despite all this blah, blah talk about evangelism and stuff, the hardcore reality is, is that despite all of our efforts, we are not effectively and strategically winning people to Jesus Christ. We're not bringing in the last day's soul harvest. And a proof, among many proofs of that, is that the two fastest growing religions in America are witchcraft and atheism. They're the two fastest growing religions in America. Why do you think that is? Because they promise something that the Christian church lost. They promise reality, they promise authority, they promise rulership, and ruling and reigning. The very things that are lacking in biblical doctrine, or if they're included in biblical doctrine, they're included in such a way that it becomes a heretical faith teaching type of thing. So, all across the board, if we look at it from a business perspective, the evangelical church, let's pretend the evangelical church was Coca-Cola, and I don't know, Witchcraft was Pepsi. All right? The critical thing to understand here is that um, 
we are losing, if we were to look at the Christian church as a business, we're losing market share. Our demographic of potential customers, there exists an enormous amount of people who potentially would want the product of Christianity and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? We're in a coronavirus nightmare. We're in, in, in a financial crisis nightmare. We're in an interpersonal relationship nightmare. We're in an all-time record high of depression, suicidal thoughts, anxiety. The need neurologically and emotionally is screaming out in people. People are in pain. They're desperate for answers, but they're not going to the doors into evangelical churches. They are going to meetings of witchcraft and atheism, etc., etc. And eight out of ten kids from evangelical homes are walking away from their faith in Christ. So all of these contradictory feedbacks are happening. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Because it's a serious problem. If we continue on in the manner which we have been traveling on, we are going to fail in our mission of a divine call of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring in the last day's soul harvest, to win as many souls as we possibly can through evangelism, and to ignite or light the fires of an authentic biblical revival. That, among other things, is our call, and to preach intelligently a biblical worldview. That, among other things, is our call. But we are going to fail in that mission if we keep rejecting God's instructions, God's commandments, where he specifically teaches, tells, and commands us precisely what we need to do to successfully evangelize, bring in the last day soul harvest, and to um, light the fires of a global biblical revival, which is what our call is. And we're called to do that. So what's the problem? Well, we're going to be back in just a second, and we're going to deal with the problem. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report <clears throat> on Paul McGuire, and you can hear us basically anywhere <clears throat> Excuse me, on planet Earth. I want to get back to what's the problem, and by that I mean, why are we losing in a temporary sense? Why are Christians losing the culture temporarily? Why are Christian parents <clears throat> losing their children? And by that I mean, why is it? I mean, let's ask ourselves questions that deal with reality, not fantasy. Why is it that 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes are walking away from their faith in Christ by the time they graduate high school. These are make it or break it questions. They're important. They're earth shattering. We're not, you know, the, the most critical thing to understand right now is that all those people who know history and have learned the lessons of history, those people are not running around like chickens with their head cut off, and, and wondering what's going to happen next. Anybody who has a basic understanding of history knows with precision pretty much what's going to happen next. Why? Because what we're going through now, the human race has gone through, other nations have gone through, numerous times repetitively, you know, like every hundred years or so. So, everything you see happening in America, including the, the Marxist riots in the streets, the promotion of Marxism, the fact that, it shouldn't surprise you, it's the globalist elite financing all the demonstrations. And then, of course, to solve the problems, there's the printing of money. And anybody who has a... a, a a brain the size of a red ant knows that <clears throat> all throughout history, when governments spend too much, the way they bail themselves out is they print money from nothing. That began in ancient Babylon. 
that always, without exception, produces inflation. In other words, so it's like a short fix. It's like heroin or meth or something. It gets the economy high, <clears throat> and then it's going to crash the economy. That's where we're headed. You say, well, how do you know that? How can you be certain of that? Because I'm not a blanking idiot, and neither are you. If you did a little reading, and most of you that listen to my program, you do do reading, or you wouldn't listen to me. But let's be honest, you and I both have a whole lot of friends, many of them Christians, and I shiver when I hear their answers. They don't know anything about anything. And and like in New York, they used to call those people suckers because they, 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 would, they would swallow anything. Okay, so what's the way out? Well, the Bible tells us we're in a life and death struggle between the powers of darkness and the powers of God. And this is going to be an all-out spiritual war that will culminate in Armageddon before the second coming of Jesus Christ. In this interim period, it's my job and your job, assignment 101, to occupy until Christ comes, to make disciples of all nations, to communicate a biblical worldview to people, and most of all, to win people to Jesus Christ. With the percentage of believing Christians that live in America now and across the world, we certainly do have enough true Bible-believing Christians to constitute what would be called a remnant church in America and Europe. There is a numerical percentage that's big enough that you could call a remnant church in America. That means saying we don't have enough numbers is a bogus excuse. God has given us the power to change the direction of the spiritual battle. God has given us the power to win this spiritual battle and drive back the forces of darkness. But God is waiting for us to act on what he's already taught us in his word from Genesis to Revelation. And so what is needed at this hour above everything else is wisdom. It's strategy. It's the knowledge to be effective. People that are in spiritual warfare that are not effective aren't going to be around very long. I want to tell you something. From the bottom of my heart, I believe with every fiber in me, every cell in me, that it is possible for the remnant church in America and across the world to literally change the direction of the spiritual battle 180 degrees. I believe that this spiritual war is a winnable war. I believe that God is waiting on his people to stop playing church and to blow, and for the watchman to blow the shofar, to blow the trumpet, so that God's people will be roused and ready to go into battle, and so that God's people will be spared from the bloodthirsty plans of the enemy. Let me spell it out to you. I want you to read my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And I want you to read also Conquering the Matrix and Volume 2 of A Prophecy of the Future of America. Why? Because those books, especially The Greatest Battle, will show you step by step what is going to be happening in the USA and the world, step by step in the oncoming months and years ahead. Now, how can you be so bold, you might say? Because I have bothered to study history, and history repeats itself. And the tricks that the politicians and the lies that the politicians are using now, it has been done over and over again. And so there's nothing new under the sun. So. We have to, at this strategic moment, we must recognize that God has placed us in this lifetime, in this time zone, for a strategic moment. God didn't waste his breath when he created you to be here for such a time as this. God created you 
above all, to be alive, well, and kicking at this strategic moment in history. And if you will embrace the knowledge that God has for you in his word and act on it by faith together, it happens together. Read the book of Genesis, the principle of oneness, over and over again. When the church met and the Spirit of God was poured out in the book of Genesis, the the exponent, exponential multiplication of abilities and everything else when God's people work together. If we will focus on a single spiritual battle goal, and we will commit ourselves to it, <clears throat> and we won't back down, and we'll put our full faith in the power of God to give us the ability to do it, I promise you, I know that I know that I know, based on the integrity of God and based on the integrity of God's Word, that this is a winnable war and we can turn the spiritual battle around. That means we can realistically expect in America and any other nation where this is implemented a massive last day soul harvest, a biblical revival in which millions and millions and millions of people miraculously and biblically accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's on that high bar, it's on that challenge, that together you and I are focusing in on the future. And we will overcome in the power of Jesus Christ. This is your brother in Jesus Christ, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. I need your prayers. I need you to spread the message far and wide, and I need you to seek the Lord and ask God, God, what would you have me donate financially or with my contributions? And then obey the Lord in all three of these areas. God bless you. This is your brother, Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. 